Okay. Oh, and there we it's, are. It's live. So we're live. So good afternoon, uh, everyone watching from Flagstaff, the larger Coconino area, state of Arizona, uh, the U.S. and around the world. Thank you so much for spending some time with us this afternoon to talk with us and pop into the Live Black Experience Barbershop, uh, an ongoing program that we've had going on for a couple of months now where black folks, specifically black men, come together and talk about issues that are important to us, topics and goings on in the world, um, our perspectives and our life. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about fatherhood. It's a belated Father's Day celebration. Uh, there's a lot to unpack with fatherhood, especially in the black community. We've got dads on the line. We got people with dads on the line. We got people with mentors that were men on the line that, that um, were just as important. And so today we'll be sharing some of our lived experience and perspective. Um, for folks who've watched this before, a lot of these faces are familiar. Um, but for the sake of making sure we're being inclusive, let's go around real quick, take a brief second to introduce ourselves, let everyone know who they're hearing from. I'll get us started. My name is Jermaine Barkley. Um, I'm part of the African Diaspora Advisory Council. I'm also the chairman of the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Leadership Council, and the first episode Psychosis Grant Coordinator for Health Choice Arizona. Honored to be with you today. And we'll go over to Dr. Martin Tees. Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Martin Tees. I am with the Office of Inclusion, Multicultural, and LGBTQIA plus Student Services at Northern Arizona University. And I go by he, him, and his pronouns, and I'm glad to be here today with everybody. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate that. Mr. Melvin Hall, Mr. President. Good evening, gentlemen. Pleasure to be here. Melvin Hall, Phoenix, uh, actually surprise Arizona, uh, graduate chapter president of the Alpha Epsilon Sigma graduate chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, founding member and uh, board of director member for the Blue Crescent Nonprofit Foundation here in Phoenix, as well as Alpha Epsilon Sigma LLC uh, business as well. Uh, happy to be a part of this um, father as well and join by some outstanding men in the community. Look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Melvin. Next, we got Chris Page. Greetings. Greetings to, to everyone that's out there. Uh, again, my name is Chris Page. I am faculty at the Frankie College of Business at the, on the College of Northern Arizona University. Um, also a father too. So looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, appreciate you. And then we got Mr. Kevin Chase. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin Chase. I'm a father of two, a 15-year-old girl, as well as a 13-year-old girl. And I'm happy to be here tonight. Happy to have you, happy to have you. And then we got Mr. Warren Brown. Uh, thank you. I am Warren Big Time Brown, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, Arizona State Director. Uh, IT consultant, construction guy, you name it, uh, I've done it, uh, humble servant. I am a father of three boys and a vasectomy, and maybe we can get to that, because <laughs> that fourth one, that, that's my baby right there, but uh, maybe we can talk about that, <laughs> real talk, but uh, uh, talking to you guys from Dubai, Abu Dhabi, uh, I, I'm just so blessed to be in this room amongst the, this caliber of individuals here. And I'm also, there, there's other stuff we've been involved with, but I'm just, I'm just so blessed and honored to be part of history in relationship to Flagstaff and the strategic plan that the Flagstaff City Council approved this past year as it relates to the African-American community. That's huge, fellas. Congratulations. Thank you guys so much for allowing me and my organization to be a part of that. Bravo, we appreciate that shout. And all everybody's hard work on that. You know, these things wouldn't be happening without these conversations, without everybody grinding, putting in the grunt work behind the scenes. It's not always a bunch of beauty like you're seeing on your screen. It's not always so, <laughs> like there is, so there's a lot of sweat behind the scenes. So we, we appreciate yes, that. Sir. Appreciate you. Next we got Dr. Ricardo Guthrie. Oh, good evening. Thank you. I'm so glad to be on this panel here with uh, all these black men who are telling good stories and uh, taking care of business. I'm a uh, professor of uh, ethnic studies since uh, 2008 
up here on the mountain in the sacred peaks um, and uh, currently working really hard with the African American Policy Forum to combat the wave of repressive legislation that is scaring the crap out of everybody. It's not everybody who is attacking racial justice, but the minority, the white minority is getting scared. And so whenever people do stuff like this and present themselves, they find a way to attack us. Um, and so again, there's strength here on the board um, because this is not the first attack and certainly won't be the last. So thank you for uh, bringing us here. Oh yes, I'm also the proud parent of two um, African-American warrior sisters, Aoife and Maya, age 17 and 20. I see it. Thank you so much, Dr. Guthrie. I appreciate that. And then lastly, we got Edward Lumpkin. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Edward Lumpkin. Uh, I am uh, also associated with Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. I'm actually the uh, first VP. Uh, in addition, I've been in banking for over 25 years, currently work at American Express. And then also I'm an adjunct at Phoenix College, as well as a father of two, soon to be two that are leaving my house. So very excited about that. <laughs> I hear you. This part, I, I totally forgot to mention, I got a baby. She in the other room. Uh, also, I told you, everybody mentioned in the kids, I almost forgot what we're here for. I also got a baby. <laughs> Not as far as long as everybody else's baby, so I got a lot to learn tonight. Uh, anyway, we're going to get started. Um, just as a, a word of warning, this is a few times now that I've talked I've talked to, I think, all of you now, a handful of times at least. I was raised as a military brat, so I always start with the formalities where I know them, but I feel like we, 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 we've, we've had some conversations here. Um, so if it's all right with everybody, we're going to stick with the first name basis because um, uh, it is a barber shop and, and that's generally how that kind of thing is done anyhow. So um, we'll be sticking with first name basis. I'll be throwing out some questions um, and we'll keep it casual. If you got something to say, please just jump in, lend your perspective. Um, that's what people are here to hear. Um, so we'll get started. Like I said, we're talking about fathers. And the first question I want to throw out to the group is, what does it mean to be a dad? Um, and what's the role of the father in a family? Who gets the first haircut? I'll take that since mine is overgrowing here. Um, <laughs> the role, and again, it's under contention depending on uh, what, the, what the wife thinks. But um, ultimately, the role of being a father um, you know, I'm a little older, I guess, but um, if to ensure that the family is protected and provided for, those are the two things I say. And uh, honestly, it has grown past those two things. But I, I think um, the wife and kids would agree, at least agree to that. But then they might disagree about how you protect and um, provide. But those are two things, those two P's that I see. Parent, provide, protect. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback off of that. Um, it's definitely all those things, but also being another P, being a presence in their life. Um, you know, certainly being being a, a dad is, you know, anybody can write a check, you know, but, you know, the the capital that kids really seek is the, the time component. So being a presence in their life, making sure that, you know, they're valued and, uh, you know, certainly putting in um, – you know, what you deem is, you know, something that uh, from a character, just upbringing standpoint, something that you instill in them that, you know, they can, these life lessons that they could take with them for the rest of their life. I'm going to jump in and say um, I'm probably the only person on this panel that is not a father. So unless you count a pit bull mixed with Sharpe, which I know <laughs> might make some people upset. But, um, yeah, no, you know, I mean, my dad, uh, I, I think, you know, it's about, I think, mentorship and also role model along with everybody else and what they said. Yeah, I like that a lot. You know, and to kind of piggyback off of that about role modeling, I think it's about modeling the behavior that your kids are going to find acceptable in their other relationships when they grow up. Um, you know, especially if you got a baby girl or, or you got a, a son that identifies as gay and they're going to get, they're going to start dating, they're going to have friends. They're going to have partners and they're going to learn 
what's okay by watching you a lot of times. That's what, I, what I've learned about watching you. And so it's a big part about modeling what's it mean to be a good man, right? You know, to help them set those standards uh, on, on what, what's acceptable in their own lives. Don't everybody jump in at once. <laughs> I, I, I'll add another P to that. Um, I, I, I'm going to say position. And what I mean by position is in terms of a man and in terms of a father is we have an obligation to lead. We have to. That That is our obligation and to be that leader. And, and you know, and uh, all, the, all you brothers have touched upon it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that our boys are going to follow. You know, and and I and hopefully we get to some some really good questions because a lot of young men um, reject that uh, those figures that are trying to do what's best for them, and some of them can't see it. And being an individual, my young individual myself, there's things I've rejected that were in my best interest that I didn't do. So I'm not saying that I have unclean hands, but Somewhere along the line, we have got to get back to leading young men. So that position is definitely important. Good words, Warren. Um, I'm going to follow you guys in regards to that, uh, the, the letter P and, um, and use the word prepare. I think it's very important to make sure that as parents, as fathers, that we prepare that next generation for what's going to be moving forward in regards to their lives and also put them in the best position again in regards, in, in regards to preparation, put them in the best position to succeed in their lifetime. So as a parent, we know what we've gone through in our environment of what we've grown up as, and we can definitely apply that experience to the individuals to prepare them to either have success as an individual or uh, put themselves in the best position to be aware of what's out there. Yeah, I like that. I like that a whole lot. Um, and then segues into kind of my next question because I we're gonna kind of follow what Warren was saying, um, and we're we're gonna go down that rabbit hole about folks not necessarily, especially younger folks and your own kids. A lot of times they don't want to hear it, right? I will. I I am young. I am young. I'm still young. I'm still pretty, but I was younger not that long ago, <laughs> um, and I remember plenty of times, plenty of times, plenty of times getting the the advice getting the talks and you know your brain's not developed you think you know everything you think you're the world's strongest strongest kid and and you smart and so you don't want to hear it so so let me ask as fathers uh for 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 the fathers present and as leaders as black men what do you do how do you position yourself in such a way that people do want to hear you to follow you um, to take that advice to heart. Are there things that, that you can do as Black fathers that you do do that have been effective um, in getting folks to actually follow along to your lead? You know, that is a, a very good good question. Um, and, you know, there's no blueprint to, to raising kids. You can, you can read 50,000 books as far as like how to skin a cat, but you know, that's not necessarily going to be the, the right way for that particular um, individual or that particular instance. Um, I'm actually kind of going through that right now where I'm, I'm having a, a challenging moment with um, one of my kids, uh, my daughter. Um, she just finished high school. She's kind of jumping all over the place, you know, in terms of what she wants to do in life. She's a smart kid. Um but you know, trying to center her specifically on, on on a target. I don't want to. I've always I've always been one to give them options, but also let them know, based on your choice, you know, there's a pro and then there's a con. You know, that's the whole part about parenting. Giving them the tools to to make, you know, proper decisions. And and even if even if the decision you know is wrong, sometimes you just have to just sit back and just like bite your tongue and just be there to at least give them some advice to, to, to move them in, in a different direction. So, 
you know, you, you have to use whatever tools in your toolbox to make it work. And, you know, some in some cases, just trying to get that hammer and nail and, and pound whatever it is that, that, that you want, it's not going to work. And, you know, my daughter, of course, is, is not like that. So, you know, you, you have to find different options or different opportunities and know your know your know know the kid well enough to know what will work and what what doesn't work and uh for so for me since i'm 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 dumb and don't know anything you know i will have to find another alternative <laughs> even though i have an mba and certainly been doing i've been doing for for quite some time but you know book smarts and just you know world smarts are, are, are two different things but um i i found a way in which i can i can get her to do what at least expose what I would like for her to do without telling her. Cause I have a niece who's a little bit older and, you know, very, you know, my daughter is very impressionable as far as she's concerned. So that would be the person that I would like to probably tap on the shoulder. Hey, could you do your uncle solid and uh, have this discussion with her? But, you know, you have to know your kid well enough uh, to understand kind of what makes them tick. Cause again, it's not one size fits all. You know, so you just have to uh, figure out what will work and what doesn't work and then kind of kind of make a decision. So that's the long and the short of it. So I just before anyone else answers, I, I, I want mail. I mean, no, I'm so used to talking to Ed and Mel. Ed said something very key. He said, as he's looking for his daughter, he's actually turning to a female, which is the right thing to do because he cannot be, he is a masculine male. He does, he has not been blessed with the feminine qualities because a woman has that. So as we talk about young men, we're talking about our role as fathers and the masculinity. And some of you guys got daughters I really would like for those of you, because I, I don't know about that life. You know, I, I, I always say, good, I'm a good, good luck man. with that. <laughs> <laughs> At least that I know of. But it's important as us as men to be those role models. But I really would like for you guys to talk about, you know, you men, you have daughters. And so how have you had to kind of fall back and understand that that really wasn't your lane? It's your, 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 your lane is to be there. But when it comes to some of those finer feminine qualities, that's not you because you're not a woman. If I uh, may, Jermaine, is that cool? Uh, we're going oh, to have yeah, to yeah, now, sure. You got yeah. the, uh, what did uh, we talk about uh, yesterday or the day before Dr. T? Um, somebody had made a, a, a comment of, about that. But um, no, honestly, there has to be, a, 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 there has to be, a, the joke was, you're too binary, okay? <laughs> you're too binary, meaning a woman does this and a man does this. And Dr. T said, no, no, that's not how it works. We have both qualities, feminine and masculine. And if you don't see that in yourself, you're not, what do you say? In the Spanish community, you're not a true man. A true macho gets to be a macho because he understands the feminine side of a man. This is part of the cultural dimensions that we're embracing, not because we're Americans, we tend to over intellectualize and all that, but because it is part of other communities and cultures, two spirits and otherwise, that said we have that if we don't understand ourselves, as, as Mr. Warren Big Brown was saying, we grow into being men, but along the way, there are many different sexualities and gender roles that we do play. We want to erase that from our memory, but yeah, we do play that so that when we become fully mature, we have something to offer to our daughters that's not just totally alien. I don't know what you're going through because a lot of us do have sisters, right? We all mm -hmm. have mothers. <laughs> and uh, those of us then who become parents to daughters, that's what we're channeling, uh, Big Brown. We're channeling that because we see something in our mother and our grandmother. We see something in our sister. And then we say, wait a minute, I helped shape that too when I was growing up. My sister is a, a tomboy is what they would say. <laughs> but that, that doesn't matter. It's really that I could see a feminine side when I had to engage with her 
because we couldn't exclude her from everything. We couldn't pretend that she had to be a boy in order to get our attention. So I just want to put that out there. Don't be too binary in it, Dr. Big Brown, because ultimately yeah. our gender roles are on a continuum. And I do support Dr. Lumpkin and uh, your approach, which is let a woman try to speak to them first. I do agree with that. I do. Um, because my voice gets filtered out. <laughs> it gets filtered out. And so I try to, I do find a woman elder or a niece or something like that. So I'm, I'm trying to, to get to where both you and Mr. Lumpkin are, but I want to say, let's not just say it's those two binaries, because I found in my own life, you know, those are the choices that you get forced into, but ultimately we do have a good array of information that includes femininity as well as masculinity. Thank you for that, Ricardo. I appreciate that. Melvin, I saw you on mute. Were you about to say something? I want to make sure we don't miss you. Yeah, you know, here comes the PC incorrectness. You know, um, I raised, I have a 25 year old daughter, and my wife and I used to fuss all the time because I would tell my wife if it bleeds for five days and does it die, it's too emotional for me. And I need to make sure that my daughter is not on that emotional plane. So I raised my daughter with the mindset of a young man. No, I didn't have her playing football, basketball, but I showed her the eyes of the world through a black man so that when men talked to her a certain way or she was approached with a certain situation, she didn't get emotional. She got logical. And she said, why is this happening? How can I prevent this? Or what can I do to be better at this? So my thing with my daughter, and I guess it's been a, it's come back to bite me in the butt now that she's grown. She really has no emotional attachment to things. She can, when it comes to, to relationships, she has no problem at the blink of an eye cutting you off at the knees and keep it stepping. So I thought I was doing the right thing. Maybe in some ways it worked. And then her mother is, uh, her father was a Marine Corps drill instructor. So my wife is just tough as nails as well. So, you know, when it comes to gender roles, I, I don't know, you know, who was harder or who was more of the male, me or my wife. All I can tell you is that our daughter is the true representation of both of us, both good and bad. And if we as fathers don't raise the bar so high for our daughters, then they will lower the bar and let anything and everything. Yeah, in. yeah that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, we, we're setting the tone, right? We're setting the tone for what it is they think is okay, what they think their worth is, how strong they think they are. Daughter, son, what have you, we set the tone when you lead in the family. I want to take a step back because I've heard it twice already. I, I've heard it twice already. This is an open conversation. Um, we're not here to get our feelings hurt. Uh, you're not going to get in trouble or censored or anything for sharing your mind. That's what people are here for. People are here to hear you speak your minds. So I just oh, Jermaine, I ain't question. worried about you. Yeah, I'm I talking about that. all yeah, the women listening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I want everyone to know, you know, we we got to preface it because um, because we all got uh, valued experiences here. Um, bouncing off of what what Ricardo was saying, though, I think it also depends on this, especially if you got two parents in the house. What are the strengths, right? Because my wife, my wife is an accountant. She's an accountant. She works in business. I'm a psychologist, and I worked in social work. That that's my background. That's what I do. So she, she worked with numbers all day. She works on business. I'm talking to people. I'm talking mental health. We're talking about trauma. Um, we're talking about bad experiences. We're talking about healing. That's where I come from. So as our daughter gets older, and we start having more and more of these conversations you know, what people might look like, they might look in and think, oh, their roles are reversed or whatever, whatever. But really, we're just playing to our strengths, right? Right. I'm not going to sit here and make her try to have these conversations that she's not necessarily super comfortable having when I've done that for a living, you know, and vice versa. Uh, 
it, it, she's got strengths on being organized, working in business. I'm not going to try to take that over and say that's my thing when that's her strength, right? Because that, that can be her thing. So, I, you know, it, it can be fluid. It, it really depends. But I, it does come back to what Melvin was saying. As we set that tone, right, I think that's a big part about being a dad is I used to work in domestic violence, right? And it's cyclical, right? You grow up in an abusive home. You see a lot of violence. You don't learn a lot of emotional regulation. You either get in an abusive relationship yourself or maybe you enact some violence because that, that's what you know, right? You're young. That's what you were raised around. It's hard to break it. It's not impossible, but it's hard, right? And so as fathers, we're really the ones setting the tone. What's it mean to be an adult, right? What's a, what's a good person actually look like? Best of the ability, right? To the best of our ability. Because when you get older and you're looking for a mate, you're looking for a friend or for a partner, one of the first things you're going to remember is how do my parents get along, right? How did, how did dad treat mom in the house? Um, how did they treat me, right? How did they talk to me um, in the house? Because they love us, right? Our kids love us. And we get to define what love is for them for a long time. And that's a big responsibility I think a lot of men don't, don't think about um, and don't get taught before you, you become a dad is you're teaching your kid what love looks like. And if you got it twisted on what love is, there's a good chance your kids are going to grow up and they're going to have it twisted too. You know, that, that's just my soapbox. Jermaine. Crit. Oh, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just, I just want to. I'm just curious, and Chris and 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 uh, Mr. T's, uh, Chris, you, you're not this quiet. Don't, don't, don't be fronting, Chris. This ain't you. You, everybody know that you, 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 you could talk. I'm just curious. Go ahead. Oh man, you know I'm the quiet one here. I'm the quiet. One. <laughs> the introvert is is showing there, right? But right. I got. Right. Okay. <laughs> I should mention that I. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I have uh, uh, two kids. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have a boy and a girl. Uh, and my daughter's 28 and my son is 25. So they're a little bit older, but uh, um, but they are, uh, we are really, really, when I say we, my wife and I are really, really fortunate that uh, things are working out really well with them. Um, they, uh, um, we gave them some sort of blueprint uh, of where we wanted to go, what they wanted to, uh, what we wanted them to do in regards to, to following and moving forward to have success in their lives, and and they followed that. Uh, they followed that. We uh, made it a point to to make sure that uh, um, in this day and time, that both of them should have some sort of grad degree um, to move forward in society. Um, if they have anything after that, that's all great. But at least have that grad degree and um, and put themselves again in the best position to succeed. Uh, in their lives, and, uh, and um, my, my daughter got her MBA, and my son got his master's in um, uh, environmental studies and urban planning. So they have at least got the schooling from an educational standpoint. Um, and of course, when they see, like uh, like Jermaine mentioned, when they see uh, what's happening in the household, when they see uh, my wife and I interact the way that we re we interact, uh, you don't see a bunch of fighting. We, if we were fighting, we we're fighting in closed doors, right, or something like that. I mean, we're not perfect. <laughs> we're not perfect. I'm not saying right. that at all. But uh, but we're we're not trying to show um, this life, this married life, is bad. Um, and they see that, and and hopefully they can take that model and move forward and having that same type of success in their lives and how to move forward. My wife and I have been married for uh, it'll be thirty years in July, so. Uh, so we're trying to present that model to them. Um, and at the same time, we're, we're trying to, to lay out a blueprint on what they need to do to succeed in every aspect of life. Um, I should mention also that, uh, um, like I stated earlier, we have a, a, a boy and a girl. Um, uh, my daughter is more like me. <laughs> I know there's uh, some female uh, traits that I can't uh, tell her that she shouldn't be doing or what she should be doing and all that. I understand that. And, and my wife fill that void in any uh, way that we possibly can. Um, and the same applies to my son. Uh, there are um, men traits that I need to make sure that he knows and understands and lay out and follow. Um, 
That's why he's a member of the world's greatest fraternity. Also, I thought I mentioned that. You you did talk about that that is not perfection, right? For everybody that wonder where that powder keg came from, we were having a debate before we went live, and 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 Chris decided to blow everybody's spot. I tell my daughter all the time that uh, I know what she's thinking before she even thinks it, right? And she tells me the same thing. Uh, because we're we're really uh, close and interact with each other, and um, and I'm really fortunate to have that type of relationship with her. Um, but at the same time, I have a, a, a relationship with my son, and, and my wife has the same type of relationship uh, with our kids. Also, in fact, my um, my son and my wife are, are close. They're like really close, and and uh, and they uh, they have a very good relationship. Also, so. Um, uh, the things are working out between uh, both of the kids. They're uh, they're doing their thing, and they haven't gotten any trouble. Knock on wood. Uh, and, uh, and things are, are we are just truly blessed with the way things have been working in our household. I mentioned that. Thank you, Mark. You know, and that brings up a question that I want to ask, especially fathers of daughters, because I got a daughter. She's a year and a half, though, so I haven't gotten to a lot of these. <laughs> I haven't gotten to these bridges yet. And one of the things I constantly find myself like extra conscious of and aware of, because she's a girl, she's a baby girl. She don't got all her color yet, but it's coming. Mine came in late. I know she's going to get dark. <laughs> and so- Shout out to the light skin crew. Yeah, shout out to the light skin crew. <laughs> so the question I, I got for y'all is, when you, especially when you're raising a black daughter, usually they're at the top, black women are at the top of the oppression Olympic list a lot, right? Black men get paid less than black, or, or white men, but black women get paid even less. Uh, it took forever to, for black men to get the vote, took even longer for black women to get the vote, right? It, it, they gotta work, if we gotta work twice as hard, a lot of times they gotta work two and a half times as hard in the workplace, right? Because of all of the extra stuff attached to not only the color of their skin, but they're also a woman. So they got a bunch of stereotypes. So how do you raise, and maybe this goes to what you were saying, Melvin, how do you raise your, your daughter to where she's not buying into any notions and Edward and, and Ricardo and Chris to where she's not buying into any notions that her being a woman makes her less capable for some reason. But, uh, you know, what is that? What do those conversations look like to where you're making sure she doesn't think, oh, I'm weaker or I'm not as smart or I can't go into doing X, Y, and Z? Yeah, you know, I, I'll, I'll start first if that's okay. Um... You know, a lot of a lot of um, life lessons that that I've really kind of um, gravitated towards were ones given by my mother. Believe it or not, one of the uh, life lessons was don't make excuses, and which is kind of interesting because you know that that's like the backbone of any D nine organization excuses. Um, but you know, my mom really was not one for it. You know, you know, keep in mind my mom grew up in the, the civil rights era. You know, my grandmother, she helped uh, um, desegregate schools in their area. She was called, my mom was called all kind of words. And uh, she still um, finished school, went to college, graduated, and was a teacher for over 35 years. You know, my mom has is, is had adversity. You know, my, my grandparents, they were poor. Um, you know, she was one of 14 kids. You know, so there was no, I can't. You know, there was you will do. And, um, you know, my grandmother didn't take any uh, excuse. My mom didn't take any excuse. And, uh, you know, that these were this was a mantra that was passed down to both my sister, and myself. And so we've instilled that into our, our children. And, uh, you know, we don't you know, I. Um, I try not to allow her the excuse you know, if, if she is not good at something, you know, I said, well, let's let's find a different different way or different path to uh, uh, that challenge that that you're having some difficulty with. But, you know, we're not going to quit and we're certainly not going to uh, uh, make any type of excuses or the teacher doesn't like me or the work is too hard or I don't know if I can do it or whatever. You know, and it's like, you know what, that's that's life. And, you know, it, the, the sooner that they learn that that life lesson, the better off their life will be. 
because there always will be a reason to quit. That just doesn't, you know, but you don't give them that option to quit. So whether it's my daughter or it's my son, I don't believe in quitting because once somebody is uh, learns learns that it's okay to quit, they they won't stop. So that is the life lesson that uh, you know I I try to preach to my kids to make sure that they understand um, that you know whatever it is that you're going through, there's always an an option and opportunity. Just don't make excuses and get the job done. Yeah, that's a and, and let me uh, throw. A, I'm gonna come to you right after Melvin because I see you. Uh, I'm gonna modify this question just a bit though for everybody. Um, you know, not even just for black women, um, but for black kids in general. You know, Chris Rock does this great bit, and actually, one of his last stand up specials, you know, he was talking about, you know, I make everything that's white in my house dangerous. You know, if you sit on the toilet, it's gonna be 300 degrees, and it, you know, it, you know, the, every, the fridge is gonna fall. It's like Chris heavy. Rock. Yeah, because you gotta learn type thing, because you, you're trying to teach your kids that it's hard, you know. You got a target on your back. You stand out. So to alter the question just a bit, how do you teach your black kids that they're not less than um, because of their color? That 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 doesn't make them any less capable. Um, and we can stick with the theme of black daughters too, but just to make it any more broad. Um, or who taught you, and how did they teach you that you're not less than because of the color of your skin? And we'll we'll go. I'll go to you now, Melvin. Thanks. You know, Jermaine, um, you said you mentioned that you have a daughter that's a year and a half. I reflect back to when my daughter was that age and, and I male or female, but I'm going to just talk on daughter right now because I do have a son as well. Tell her how beautiful she is. Every day, because you think she's going to catch it bad from white people, she's going to catch it worse from black people our black daughters catch hell if they're too dark they're too light their hair is curly their hair is nappy whatever the case may be our daughters from birth are ingrained with their less than so my daughter to this day I write affirmations on her uh, mirror. You know, um, same thing with your sons, man, but that's a different conversation. And I'll let Warren and some of those guys, but for uh, Hamlet, you know, for me, I didn't get those lessons from my parents. Uh, my wife and I both are estranged from our parents. Um, I grew up that my family is not my blood. Uh, the people I consider mother, father, brothers don't have my last name. So I also taught my daughter that the people that she can count on the most a lot of time won't have her bloodline. But that doesn't determine love or, or quality of care or who a person is. So, you know, your daughter's man Tell her every day how beautiful she is. Give her black dolls. Show her black role models. Read her black stories. And you know what you tell her? When they tell her she's not dark enough or she's too dark, she can quote out the best from Harriet Tubman to Michelle Obama to Camilla Harris. You can cross the spectrum because women of color are the most beautiful thing. They are the mother of all. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. So that's the message I share to her. Melvin preaching. Uh -huh. Melvin preaching. I appreciate you sharing that. Preaching. What about the rest of y'all? Either how do you teach your kids uh, that they're not less than because of their color, because of them being black? Or who in your life taught you? And how did they teach you that? <laughs> you know, I agree. I guess I'll jump in because I'm the only one that has not had the, the issue or the trauma or the strife or the beauty of raising children. Um, but as the youngest child, um, hell, the youngest cousin, the youngest, or whatever, Warren, you're shaking your head. You know, <laughs> you know my dad. Um, yes, sir. 
Right. So, you know, I think the biggest thing, you know, my dad passed last year. Um, no condolences, so, man. Man, so um, in this July, my him and my mom would have been married for 55 years. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, trying to deal with that and think about the thing that, that he did, the, the, one of the best things that he did is that he had in the sense of he had a strong black woman, you know, with him raising his children. So, um, and, and they were equal. You know, and so I can't tell you that, you know, if I was going to get an ass whooping from one, I was going to get an ass whooping from the other. It was coming no matter what. <laughs> Facts. And, Facts. And man, uh, my uncle, you know, my dad, I think, worshipped his brother, his older brother, Frank. So whenever he would come to town, it would just be like a showcase of just like, you know, let me see who can make our kids jump and do the, you know, do the most. Um, <laughs> but I, I say all that to say that, like, you know, what my dad, what my dad really, I think, wanted his kids to know. And even, you know, he had a love of family, you know, he had a love of community. Um, he never wanted us to think that we were less than. And he also made sure that we knew that we were no better than either. Um, and that we always had that love for family. We respected elders. Um, you know, he, he surrounded himself not only around his siblings, um, but other friends, you know, that if you got, you know, trust me, I, I remember telling my uncle he couldn't say nothing to me because he wasn't my daddy. And by the time I woke up, you know, <laughs> after the off with him, um, I think I got another one, you know. So, so I go to say that I think, you know, what the, the lifelong lesson that I think my dad taught me um, and what he really tried to raise us with is one was integrity and respect. We knew who we were once we came from, you know, there's a strong tease family bond um, that he wanted us to be a part of. You know, it was interesting. He didn't, they didn't have any girls, um, but three of my cousins kind of like the Cosby show came and lived with us. So we had girls. So he made sure that they were taken care of. Um, there's a story that I love to tell that's it's not true, but it sounds fascinating. But one of my cousins, um, his, his older sister's daughter was living in Vegas. Um, probably was having a rough time with it. So my dad, my uncle, and three of their friends went down to go pick her up and brought her back from Vegas. You know, and, and so I, I don't know how the story went, if they went and threatened the dude, you know, whatever. But I know that they brought, they were like, you're coming back and you're staying with us. So she, you know, I call her my sister. So she would live with us, you know, probably for 12 years. But I think, you know, that was the thing. He wanted us to know family. Um, and the other thing that I would tell you, um, and I always tell people I had a healthy fear of my parents. Um, and I say that to say, um, if y'all know all my Phoenix people um, in high school during homecoming, I was driving home. My dad had a brand new, you know, BMW and I got pulled over and the police. By the time I got out of the car, it was 16 police officers and me, you know, and Warren, you remember I'm tall, lanky, you know, high yellow, you know, whatever. But they they thought I stole a car. And so in telling the story and showing you about my dad and the respect, I was like, man, um, if I had stolen this car, I would be safer with the police than I would be, you know, going home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but he was always dead. You know, he was always, you know, um, a, a father figure. He was always those things. And so you kind of respected that, um, you know, and people laugh because, you know, I'm, 50 years old, but I still call him daddy, you know, because that's, who, you know, but he was my father. I knew who he was. He was always there. He always, you know, cared. Even when you didn't do what he didn't want you to do, I couldn't play sports like my brother could or in some of my cousins, but I played and he wouldn't let me quit until, you know, I got to that point where like, this just ain't my thing, you know, but I, I, I put it in now, if I could play now, Ooh, I'd be in the pro, but back then, <laughs> you know, but he would be like, that's all right. Like, you know, but you get in there, you do your thing, you be who you are. So he was that person, you know, all the way up until, you know, when he passed away. So, so I guess, you know, when you talk about, and I think Ricardo, you said something about community. My dad put us around a community of folks, right? So we were around not only those who were educated, we were not only around those who were you know, not, you know, uh, socioeconomically poor advantage. You know, I mean, I love the fact that he had us around an entire group of folks. So even when you think about the question about the binary of being a father with all girls or, you know, or even a mother with all boys, they made sure that we were around everyone. We were around strong black women. We were around, we were around strong women, period. You know, so, um, you know, so uh, we, we had 
had those role models and we saw those different things about how um, relationships go. So even carrying into relationships, I know I found like, I was like, I can't really talk to nobody if I can't have what my parents had, not realizing that I have to do my own, you know, my own set of work. But I'm like, you know, they were together 50 something years. So we not talking, you know, like that. Like, I mean, at the minimum, you know, we not talking, you know, 50 years then, you know, we probably not really talking like, you know, a relationship. We might be hanging out or something, but you know, <laughs> real talk. Right. You know, so I mean, so that was I mean, I guess, you know, to the point, that's what my father and I think even my mother and then all those men that my dad allowed to be around us to help guide and mentor us, you know, as children, I think is the best thing that they did. But the key was, like you said, telling us that we were no better, no worse, you know, and knowing who and what we came from. We would have to interview uh, Martin about his father. I meant to do that last year before he passed, and I was so upset because he passed. But Martin, you tell the story beautifully, and so we still have to do that because there's a whole lot more to what you're saying. Um, and and I'll just um, do a quick segue that um, our parents came from that um, depression era, and they didn't take nothing from nobody. <laughs> My father said, you always have to have a second gig, even if you're making whatever you think you're making. You better have a side gig. And my mother's was like, hey, who said life was fair? <laughs> so, Preach. You know what I'm saying? That's that's the way it was. And, I'm, you know, unfortunately, growing up with five boys and one girl, that was what was translated. It doesn't work so well with my kids now. So um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that we taught them Kwanzaa. Their first five or six years, they were in a protective bubble. They were in that community that Martin was talking about so that if you got in trouble, there was always two or three other people who would take a, an ounce out of your hide before you got home. And so my girls have that. But then the fish is the last to know water, right? The people who breathe air have no idea until that air is taken away from them. We brought them to Flagstaff and they started to drown. And they were gasping for air because that thing that we had taught them in their home community did not exist here. So we had to recreate that and find people like Chris and Martin and Bernadine and Coral and uh, right. uh, half a Ms. dozen Deb. like Miss Deb mm -hmm. and uh, Michelle Harris. And they created that community so that they had something. But I'll tell you, again, the fish is the last to know water. And that means that regardless of what we told them, it's still in there. The society pushes them down. Their level of esteem and self-esteem takes a hit because they are the only ones. Um, and I know Tiana and um, uh, Kevin uh, Chase's daughters will say the two because they get to be Afro-Latino as well. And so they may not fit the paradigm that the rest of the black community is telling them. So I just want to put that out there because we're in the environment where we have to drink that all in and swim in it. Some of it um, is very hurtful. And, and I, you know, again, I nod mm -hmm. to train to say you cannot deny that regardless of what you take to the mm -hmm. ball. Game, right. <laughs> Something else is going to happen once you get on that field and it won't be fair and you can't just get out of the game. But you have to also recognize, hey. I need to help them get off the field, you know, in a coherent way so they can go back in the game. And as an instructor, yeah. as an educator, I'm taught how to do that. But they see me coming a mile away and say, oh, that's the professor telling me, you know, yeah. <laughs> I need to yeah. know who isn't you telling it. And so that's, again, uh, um, two or three things that, that come to mind based on what I've heard so far. To be in a community will save you. But as other people have said, it can also hurt you. Because, well, okay, how you define community is going to come up later. We'll talk about that. But that, yeah. 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 So, and, and that's a good point. I, oh, go ahead, Juan. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, all right. I, okay. Give me a second here. As, as we're listening to everybody, I, I make little notes. And, you know, Jermaine, kudos to you for for guiding the conversation and understand sometimes the conversation is going where it needs to go organically. Oh, yeah. Kudos to you for allowing it to do so. But just like Ricardo wrote down a couple of things, I wrote down a couple of things and where I'd like for us to talk about, why are we all doing the same thing? 
what is it about how we're all approaching it? And none of us have huddled to say, this is how we're going to do it. We are doing it yeah. instinctively and organically. And, and I want the audience to know how these, these totally disconnected people can be on the same page uh, simultaneously. But I want to yeah. go back to a, a couple of things. When, when Ed talked about you know, not quitting and Martin talked about it, is that there's a difference between quitting and exercising options. Somebody treats you like crap. Well, uh, you don't have to take it. Do you quit or are you exercising your options because you know your worth? Yeah. You're going to do something else. So yeah. you have to understand the difference. And real talk, Martin, when you were talking about your dad, having known you and your family for so long, dog, I feel you, man. I'm so sorry, man. My, my, my deepest condolences, which goes back to... When Ricardo talking about the softer side, some people think that I'm harsh. I think I'm direct, but it's the whole thing of the steel and the velvet. We do have those softer qualities as well. But when I can look at you as a man and feel your pain and understand, understand that hurt that you went through and having known your dad and who he was and what represented, dog, I feel that too. He's not my father biologically, but he's my father in terms of the community. And I lost him to it. Definitely not to your degree. I would never, ever say that. But knowing you and knowing your nephews, knowing your brothers, dog, I, I feel you. And I know that I would use a different. I know it bothers you. I was going to say something else, but I'm going to keep it that way. But I know you're still feeling that Own it. And that's where folks like Jermaine come in. I know people all the time that say, you know what, I'm struggling. I need help. But the problem is the help is not, number one, finding the help and finding good help. Yeah, competent that help. Help, <laughs> help that looks like you. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, I, I, I feel you. One of the things that Mel talked about was bloodline. So I, I look at you guys and, and I can honestly say that I am jealous. I didn't have the familial support that some of you had. Some of you have the relationships with your wives and your kids. Man, that's, that is so beautiful. I wish to God I, I had it, but I didn't. So I can't cry about it. Two years in a bucket, two, two tears in a bucket. So um, I'm just saying. But the thing is, is that when, when you have to embrace your reality, you know, uh, uh, Martin talked about uh, getting a piece taken out of his hide. And I think that uh, Dr. Guthrie talked about it too. That's discipline. We're not talking about abuse. We're talking about discipline. Yes. And when you remove that and then when you get courts involved and then it, it impedes your ability to provide that discipline and that structure and those guiding principles to your kids. And now, especially young black boys. I, I'm not minimizing women at all, but black boys, we have got to teach them. You are going you are a young black man. And I'm going to tell you, you think I'm tough. <coughs> you ain't you ain't lived in this society yet. So I know I have an obligation to protect you and prepare you. And you may not like yeah. it, but I am not your friend. I am yeah. your father. I have an obligation. So and with that with that last piece, just so I and I don't know if the if the world knows this, but you know, everybody knows my name is Warren Brown. That's really not my name. My actual name is Warren Browning. My grandfather was a gentleman by the name of Otis Browning. But my grandmother changed the name. Now, also, I can't. I, I know the person who was on my birth certificate, and I know the person who I called that. But I can't tell you one hundred percent that that's my actual father. Now I'm breaking down, and I'm getting into an area that some people are like, "Whoa!" But I'm just talking facts, fellas. There's so much, and you've got to look at. So with me and my unreal sense of family i've had to develop a new one so yeah. that yeah. and that's what mel is talking about but it's with black men so when we got involved when the greatest fraternity in the world five eight or six but shout out when we when we chartered the chapter in um at, at northern arizona university it was chris and dr page you know, them folks were there. It's like, yo, man, I I'm just happy to see y'all. You guys have been fighting this fight. How can we help? But it's the respect 
for the black men who were there before who've been putting it down. Winston's been at it, uh, Winston. Mark, I'm sorry, that's your brother. I'm okay. <laughs> You've been, you guys have been fighting that fight, and we acknowledge that, and we have humbled ourselves to you guys. It's like, you know, we're here to help. We're, we're not trying to come in and step over. We are acknowledging the work you guys put in and everybody in that community. So we have an obligation to it. And that's what we try to teach the young men. Your yeah. behinds is on this campus, and damn it, you have an obligation to this larger community. Yeah, and you know what? what um, it, it reminds me of when my dad dropped me off for college. We came from Germany. We were stationed in Germany. So, and we, it's not like, you know, it's a military family where we're rolling in dough, but it was time for me to go to school. So, you know, my mom and dad, they fly me out here um, and I got to get my license still. They only got four days, four or five days here because they don't got that much money. They got to go back. He got to get back to work. So my dad's like, all right, I'm going to teach you how to drive. We can get your license in like two days and then we're going <laughs> to drop you off at school. You know, and you know, we're growing up, my dad was tough, specifically on me. I was the firstborn, firstborn male, the first one. And they had me when they were 20 years old. So they, my dad was tough up until I was like 14 years old. And then he was like, you know what? You earned it. You're in my trust. Don't mess it up. Don't mess up the trust. Don't make me come pick you up from a police department because I won't, but you earned the trust. And so he dropped me off to college. And me and my dad, we don't have a lot of uh, like in-depth conversations. You know, we weren't sitting down talking about our feelings a whole lot. You know, that's just not who my dad is. But when he dropped me off to school, the, the, the last thing he said, right, I'm getting all emotional. I'm nervous. I don't got no family up here in Flagstaff. They're about to go back overseas. It's like a 10-hour difference. I ain't even going to be able to call them. You know, so I'm getting nervous. And he looks me in the eye and he's like, don't ever sleep with a woman that's drunk. <laughs> and don't forget where you came from. Don't ever sleep with a woman Back. that's drunk. And don't forget where you came from. And then they Ooh. left. And that moment, even though we never had a bunch of in-depth conversations, <laughs> we never talked a bunch, I knew exactly what both those things meant. I knew what he meant. He wasn't just talking about consent. He was talking about, you're a black man. You need to keep an eye out for yourself. You know, that's the, I knew all that. And when he was like, don't forget where you came from, I knew exactly what he meant, even though we never really had the conversation. I just knew it because of his example, because of family before him, because of other role models in my life. You know, that stuff gets instilled. And like Ricardo was saying, when you're younger, it feels like that stuff's not sticking, right? You're like, whatever, whatever, whatever. But I'll tell you what, that freshman year, spring break, I couldn't afford a ticket back home. Uh, I didn't have a job yet. I was alone on, on campus. I didn't have no money, but I told myself, you know what? I'm not about to call my parents and ask them for money because I know they'll give it to me, but I also know where I came from. I'm about to figure this out, you know, and made it work because that's what he told me to do. He said, don't forget where you came from. And I know that that's what we do. Um, and so for a lot of parents who are listening to this, I like to tell that story because Man, if 16-year-old me heard me telling this story now, he'd be like, that's a bunch of bullshit, man. You ain't listening to none of that stuff. But as you get older, you look back on your relationship with your parents, the way they live their lives, with your mentors and your role models. And the older you get, as much as you might want to fight it, the more that stuff starts making sense to you. And, and it starts just leaking into your lives, even though you didn't know you even had those memories. And so hearing, hearing what you were saying, Warren, Man, that that I remember some of those same conversations with my dad. Like it, it ain't gonna be fair. It's gonna be hard out there, and you just gotta suck it up and be ready for that. Uh, and I was lucky enough to have parents around who got me ready for that. You know, got me ready for that. Hey, Jermaine, you know, if I could just add in, you know, you we've we've talked a lot about, you know, as fathers, what our roles are and how we can impact, you know, our kids' lives, the communities, and so forth. And and we've spent some time talking about, you know, our daughters. I just want to encourage you this, you know, keep in mind that that young girl is going to grow up one day and she's going to want to date someone and, 
fall in love and all this crazy stuff. So when she turns 16, have her have all her girlfriends over. You look them and you tell your daughter that she can date. But the first guy that comes to the house, you're going to grab him by the back of the head, kiss <laughs> him in the mouth and tell him whatever he does to her, you're going to do to him. And you won't have any problems until she gets to about college. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I think we're recording this, so I'll be able to come back to it if I need it. I'll be able to come back to it. So I'm a lot more fluid than some of y'all. So I, I mean it. I mean it. Martin, go ahead. I know you're about to you know, I, I'm just laughing at that. But I think, you know, if you go back, I, I guess, and I'm old school. You know, I mean, I, you think about. I think I was the last generation where they had probably corporal punishment in schools, of which we got quite a bit, um, you know, and, and I think um, I just think, you know, going back with the whole fatherhood thing and you think about um, the lessons that they teach you, I think it really is about who they put you around. Right. You know, and who um, who and how they, they role model kind of ways. And so and I think, you know, I'm definitely blessed in, in the sense of what I had. Um, but then I also believe, I think we were talking about this the other day, Ricardo, was about, you know, sometimes when you don't have it, then you go and look for it. Um, and so, and I think that kind of goes back to what Warren was saying is that, yeah, all of us come from different backgrounds, but I'm just modeling what I got when I was growing up. Like, you know, and, and, and to the extent that it works, the only thing that I can't do is I can't whoop nobody's ass because then that's a, you know, I'm in jail or, or you know, I lose my job and now can never work, you know, again. But I think, but, I, but, but the students here that know me know that I'm very direct. They know that, you know, I will fight for them, you know, without abandon. Um, but you also need to come correct, right? And so you need to tell me exactly what you did and why you did it or how it happened so that when I'm there holding forth in court for you, you know, you're not hitting me with nothing that I didn't know. And so I think it, you know, and I, and I kind of modeled that after, you know, the men, the women, the community that I came from, because you're right, when you got here, you know, if you came with nobody else, you know, in the sense of NAU, they know that if they know that Chris, uh, sometimes they don't even know black faculty and staff are here. But if once we get them and they know that we're here, they know that we got them. Right. And, and, and I want them, you know, and I guess that's my fatherhood. That's that's my contribution then as I'm trying to shepherd everyone's child from whatever time they start here to get them all the way to graduation or even just to get them through the semester, you know, with no problem. But I, I just I think I go back and listen to that and just want to say it's it's about trying to model um, what we had or finding what I didn't have and then making it. That's who I want to be. Um, so I think, yeah. you know. You know, so, I mean, sometimes, you know, they, what is that the saying is, you know, there's a family that you're born into, but then there's also the family that you chose um, and that you choose. And so that sometimes that might even be greater than blood because you went out and found those people to be around, you know, to be around you and to support you and raise you. So, I, you know, again, I just think about go back to community, role modeling, you know, what you've seen before. And then, you know, and then being around brothers that, you know, in this case, being around brothers that you know that make you want to be a better person. Yeah, yeah. And as as black men and black fathers, we gotta be ready for that. Like we gotta be ready for somebody gonna need us. Not everybody has the role models. Some people they get all first 18 years, they didn't get the role models, they didn't get the support, and they're gonna show up in your communities, in your schools, at your workplace, you know, in your neighborhood. And you gotta be ready to be. A mentor to them too, you know, and, and take them in. Jermaine, brothers, that's why this is so important. I'm going to use myself as a personal example. I'm 52. And uh, Warren and I, when we first met probably about four or five years ago, it was one of the worst encounters ever. <laughs> I'm surprised Warren didn't kick my ass all across Phoenix. I'm going to be honest with you. Worst conversation ever. <laughs> Last words was F you Warren, F you Mel. Boom. <laughs> I'm involved in a community service project and I reach out to Ed Lumpkin. And Ed and I engage in a conversation. And through that conversation, he reached out to Warren. 
And Warren was like, F Mel, nah, I ain't messing with that cat. No. Ed was like, give him a chance. And Warren did. And through that, Ed, Warren, and myself were able to form a, a bond and a friendship that has allowed us to do far more than Phi Beta Sigma. I say that because Warren That's okay. Warren Warren has been like a father to me. And we need more of that in the community to support ourselves because being a father and being a black man is hard. And there's no manual that comes with it. There's no right and wrong. And you learn a lot of it the hard way. Experience is a tough teacher. It gives us tests first. Most of us fail. And we learn the lesson later. So we need this conversation. And we have to expand it for guys like me to be better. Thank you. Hey, bro, bro. I that's awesome, man. That's awesome, man. Uh, that's it. I, I have to say, uh, before Warren, you can say, Big Brown, um, this is a time when we uh, apologize for the mistakes that we have all made. And uh, I'd be the first to say I might have lost the um, the battle, but I didn't lose the lesson. And, uh, and I was saying that to Jermaine a couple of days ago. I said, you know, just as Melvin said, there is no handbook. I had to make the mistake first. And uh, thank God we're still able to, to, you know, survive it. But I have to say that part of the being a, a father now is to be able to say, I'm sorry, I made mistakes, and I'm going to always be aware, if you will tell me, you know, if we can work that out. And I know that's part of what Mel and uh, Warren have. And that, I mean, I mean, God, that's that's what it's about. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Mel, and for being open about it. Yeah, and I, I need to follow up with Dr. G on what he just said, man. I, man, I've I've known Warren in the time period that I have known him, and and I already know that he's a good dude. Um, but um, Mel, the way that you ex uh, express that emotion on how he's been part of your life is just tremendous, man. And that it's not surprising. It's not surprising based on how I've known uh, that brother and and what he brings to the table, man. And I just uh, appreciate how you were able to uh, express that emotion that you feel from inside, man, about this good brother and how it relates to what we're talking about. What we're talking about in regards to being uh, the fathers that we need to be in this uh, society, man, I, that, that's deep, and I just appreciate it. And uh, this whole discussion has just been really deep, man. I, I'm just so grateful. There's nothing shallow about this. Nothing shallow about this discussion at all, man. It's really deep, and, and I appreciate it. I definitely appreciate it um, and how everyone's bringing uh, their perspectives to the table. You know, just knowing how important words are. I mean, Mel talked about it, Mel and Dr. T's talked about it earlier, how important it is to, to let, you know, our kids know um, that, um, that they're beautiful, that they're smart, that they're intelligent, that the positive affirmation that's needed in order for them in preparation of this life, it's important. It's important, and the fact that uh, uh, it was brought out in this discussion is is very good to hear, and I just uh, truly appreciate that. I I do my best to to make sure I pass all the the positivity uh, associated with uh, what uh, the kids are doing in their lives. How do I know that? How do I uh, express that? And um, I take my experiences. I um, I think Ed talked about how his, his parents were, were raised in the, the civil rights area era. I was born in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama in 1964. <laughs> so my parents were in Birmingham during this civil rights where they were fighting, where they were oppressed, where they knew what was happening in regards to black people in our society during that time period. And they did nothing but pass that on to my brother and myself and my sister. Um, while we were growing up. And that helped us uh, in regards to preparing our kids, and preparing our kids to move forward and what is expected in this life that we move forward with. So um, 
the, the, the I talked about it before in regards to the generational pass down of how um, we prepare uh, that next generation and the generation after that and the generation after that of what uh, they are currently experiencing in this society and what they should be expected to experience in this society. And, um, and it's important to make sure that you use your words <laughs> to express that and put them in the best position of being that. Good job, guys. You know, I I want to I want to say something. Um, <clears throat> I know we talk about daughters, um, and I know we've talked about some experiences. I I, I want to say something that, uh, you know, you you touched upon something as far as it takes a village. My son looks up to both Mel and Warren like they're the the uncles, and I really do appreciate that because where we live, we live in uh, East Valley down in phoenix there's like you know we are we are the we are the black family you know in the neighborhood you know there you know there is there is hardly any diversity whatsoever and you know and it's and it's it's just you know where we live um my my son he's had some some issues as far as trying to adjust a matter of fact he got in some uh some, some trouble at at school where he was wrongfully expelled now i haven't shared the story and um, but I think it's a testament um, to those who, whose kids go through some things. You know, we as as black men, we're, we're, we're the hunted, we're the prey. And, you know, my son, he was he was um, he had punishment that was given to him that was not fair. It was unjust and it was excessive. And my son was devastated. And, um, you know, I, I had to help him navigate that. And we were able to find a program through one of the local community colleges where he was able to get his high school equivalency as well as uh, get college credits. Uh, just to let you know, my son will be going to Hampton in, in the fall. And uh, he did magnificent. But I will say this, uh, my my son, he's you know, born and, and, and male have met him. He's a great kid. He's an awesome, awesome kid. Um, I, I raised my kids to be polite and disrespectful and, and, and humble and but also, you know, just just out there to to handle business and Warren and Mel. There's not a week that goes by that they're not bringing up either either one of your names, and that's important because there's not outside of you know because you, your kids look at you like you know oh it's just dad, you know. But everybody else, they're very impressionable, and you know they're large in life. And you know when I'm on the phone with you, Mel, or I'm on the phone with you, Warren, you know it was like hey hey make sure you t- you tell you tell uh Mr. Brown or, or Mr. Hall. That uh, I said hi, and uh, you know he 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 is definitely um, very. I'm very appreciative of that as as a parent because you know we talk about being brothers and supporting each other. That's what it's all about, you know. Especially being, you know, black in America, especially in these times. I mean, you know, you talk about you know you you were born in Birmingham. I don't know if it it really changed that much. I think there's some things that might mask and you know they may not necessarily be bombing your house, but like I said, you know, you look at some statistics, we're still under attack. Like African American kids, they're like I don't know, how, you know, I, and and you know, especially you folks that are in education, we're we're much more likely to be expelled, suspended, arrested before the age of 18. I mean, in Arizona, it it, it is not even it's not even remotely close. There's not even like a, there's a distant second. And it's, it's certainly important that we certainly continue to use that village concept of supporting each other and our young men. So our organizations, we have, um, um, we have uh, 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 mentoring groups. I serve on the school board. Uh, I've, I'm a volunteer school board member, so I actually I serve on the school board. Take take some time out, out out of my day to make sure that they see a positive African American male that is a work professional that is at the school that is that is um, providing a positive example, a positive role model, and that's what it's all about. That village concept. So I just wanted to to to, to let Mel and Warren know from a personal standpoint. This is how both of you two. Have impacted my life. I've known Warren since I was seventeen. <laughs> Warren's always been a mentor to me and 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 a friend and uh, somebody I, I look up to. 
and Mel, you know, I've, I haven't known for very long, but I'll, I'll say this though, you know, we make enough for lost time because I, I look up to his leadership and, you know, he's, he's constantly teaching me stuff. Now I'm here. I am almost 50 years old and, you know, he's teaching me things that I, you know, it's, it's, it's taken me up to this, this long to, to figure out, you know, so it is always important, you know, whatever your affiliation, whatever your, whatever, whatever your, 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 your ties or whatever, the, the, the main tie is this, we're all black, we're all in America, and we're all in, 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 in the same fight. And we need to do whatever we need to do to raise these babies so they can have it a little bit better than we did, and they could do a whole lot more than what we did. So we laid, we laid, we laid the table out, it's time for everybody to eat, but eat, but eat, eat good. I, hey, I just let me just say, say, man, I can't... Go, go ahead, Jimmy. Uh, I don't mean go to ahead, cut Jimmy. you off, because I'm actually coming to no. you, Warren, but I can't express enough what an honor it is to be that in somebody else's life. Like, I can't even... You know, some, a lot of people only dream of that, right? Like, can only dream of having someone say, man, I wouldn't be where I was at if it wasn't for Martin, if it wasn't for Chris Page, if it wasn't for Ricardo, for Warren... <coughs> For Melvin, for Edward Lumpkin, you know that's a that's a holy space to to occupy, uh, to take up, um, and it's not easy to be that for somebody. And so I just want to acknowledge that while while we're giving each other flowers, it's a big deal. It's one of those put it in the trophy case, hang it on the raft at rafters, retire the jersey number, to have that impact on somebody's life. You know, depending on what you believe, you only hear one time. Depending on what you believe, you might only be here once ever. And so to have played that role in somebody's life where you're guiding them and you, they feel like the reason that they're successful is because of you. I mean, what more can you do or say, right? What what more can you be but that? That's That's the highest achievement. And Warren, I'll come to you now, not to blow up your spot. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Oh no, nah, no! Nah, uh, much respect, uh, uh, Jermaine. You're, you know, whatever we can do, especially being a young father, we're there. Whatever you need from us, we're there. But I, I just hope, I, and I don't know what the viewership is, but I really hope black women, in particular, are watching this, and I hope they look at the recording because. You look at all of these alpha males on this call, and we're all the the macho, the bravado, and everything. And then when Winston and Mel were speaking, and you know these brothers get emotional, we all got choked up. That's a man, folks. I just want you to. I just want people to understand: being men is not just being tough. Being men is actually being vulnerable at times. We all have that peace in us. People think that men, that men, we're we're just tough all the time. There are moments where we are challenged. There are moments that we are weak. We are fallible. That's a part of being a man, but we own it and we embrace it because that's who we are. And I don't want people to, to, to think for one minute that we're always strong. And, and when we're not strong, that's when we need that other piece of the reciprocity to, to have our back. You know, we'll, we'll go out there, we'll slay it. But, but man, sometimes we need help. We need encouragement. We need support. <laughs> You know, and, 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 and that's what it is. And, and the, if you want to know how to support us, ladies, if you want to know how to support us, ask us. We will tell you. We're men. We will tell you. And vice versa. Let us know. But then you got to understand. This 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 is not easy. And I, I shout out to everybody on this panel. You guys are freaking amazing. I am so honored just to be in the same platform with you all. And Mel, I, I, dog, do you realize what that takes to 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 be that trusting and that that much of a man and just to allow yourself to to experience that on camera? 
that's a, that that's pretty f- phenomenal. And I want you to understand, man. I love you, and 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 black men, we got to tell each other we love you more than we do. Tell our kids we love you, because you know it, it's not we, we we've somehow made it uncool for men to tell another man, yo, man, I love you. You know, I love you as a man, and that's that's just what it is. You know, it didn't. It just so I'm gonna get off my soapbox, but. It, it shout out to anybody that I've ever helped, assisted, been a part of. I'm only doing what I wish I had. I didn't have it, so I've done it. I've always heard that with great responsibility, with great power comes great responsibility. Right. And to whom much is given, much is required. Exactly. Preach. I hey, appreciate that. Preach. Brother, Brother yeah. Warren, real quick, I love you for everything that you're saying. But my brother will be so upset if you keep calling me Winston. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Man, he already got issues. He's gonna have way more if he keeps. <laughs> you know. Man, there's so many of y'all teases. <laughs> but that's all right. But you know, I want to say and and give him flowers and give him respect. One, you know, my mom got her doctorate, so that's kind of why I went uh, and went that route after I finally decided to do that. But I'm going to tell you right now, the brother that helped me get through the eight years that it took for me, two additional years to get my doctorate is Dr. Ricardo Guthrie. Um, Let me give him phone calls. Let me ask him questions. He made me mad because he would take me in one route, then another route and was doing the thing. But he always told me that I could do it, right? He always told me that I was I had the ability to carry through, um, you know, and, and showed me how it was done by just modeling, you know, who he is as a professor. So, you know, let me make sure that I, I give you that props if you've never heard me say it before, Dr. Guthrie. So, you know, you know, we think you're the man, right? And, 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 right. and, and you know, and, and Dr. Page over there, who's going to be the next president after the president, um, at NAU gets done, you know, the same, you know, we meet, we talk, you know, and, and it's a pleasure to be around another brother like, you know, like him, um, you know, and they show you kind of how to do it, you know, and how it can be done. And so it's a great way to see them and to try to model, you know, my career and profession moving that forward, even though both of them are in the faculty side and I'm on the staff side, but we're going to work on that. Um, and now, you know, like they said, I think, you know, the fact that you could be vulnerable, I think, is, and, and say what you said, and even Warren saying what you said, definitely, I think that's the one thing that I think, whether you're a male, whether you're a woman, you know, your parents is to make sure that you raise your kids to be able to um, express themselves, right, and, and, and never feel bad about, you know, crying, you know, if that's the case, you know, never feel bad about showing emotion, you know, in a way that that's healthy and productive. Um, and, you know, and the other part of that, you know, I think, um, and I think, I'm not sure if it was Ed or if it was you, Warren, but talking about quitting and options, right? I think when I decided I was no longer playing football because I wasn't my brother, you know, I couldn't catch, I couldn't take it, I couldn't do whatever, my dad wouldn't let me quit. But what he did let me do was after the season was over, was make the decision on whether, whether I wanted to go back and play. And then when I decided to go do other things, he supported those, you know, even though that may not have been what he wanted me to do, he supported me, allowed me to do that, which I wanted to do. So I think, you know, going back into fatherhood, going back into brotherhood, going back into mentorships, sometimes it's not dealing with people where we want them to be, but it's about where they are and then helping them grow and expand and figure out who they are. And that's, that's kind of how I got to, you know, got to where I'm at. And, and I think, you know, the end the words are, you know, you may not have started out where you wanted to be, but you certainly don't have to end up, you know, from those beginnings. So you can you can take those steps and find those people, you know, that will help guide you. And it's great that, you know, you and Mel, I'm warning you and Mel and Ed have found that bond. You know, the fact that you want to be what you probably didn't have. I think that's that's fatherhood for me. You know, that's the, that's fatherhood. That's brotherhood. I think that's about being a man, you know, Um and all those other things that I think we throw onto it, you know, uh, you know, sometimes it's just superficial, right? We're we're pretending to be something that we may not know about. But I think men, you know, manhood, fatherhood, brotherhood, um, all of that, I think, takes about you figuring out who you are and being able to express it. 
you know, in such a way that you're building something, you're building that community. So this has been cool. Yeah. Good to be around, bro. Oh, yeah. And honestly, and bro, Go we got to make sure that this isn't the last time we talk on 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 fatherhood and and being a man because we ain't even scratched the surface of. I got a list of, of like 30 other questions I was going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're right, and it, and, and it's not like after this call, we shed our skin and our kids disappear and we become white men with no kids. It, we're gonna be black and a lot of us, we're gonna be dads after after this call ends. And so, man, I, I learned so much from each and every one of you. Um, I, I can't express how much I, I really appreciate hearing y'all's perspective. I told, uh my daughter and wife every day that, you know, you hear people say what they, who they are and it's not true or it's an abstraction of reality. I tell, I tell, I can tell you every day that I'm a rich old white man, but at the end of the day, I'm still that black man you see and nothing is going to change that no matter, you know, what we are, what level of, of success academically, intellectually and socially we reach you know, the stigmas that we have, the burdens we have, and the the blessings and curses we have just require, uh, man, it's, I was just telling more the other day, the conversations that we need to have, and like you said, that we've got to continue to have, because if we don't have these conversations with ourselves, we're all going to go crazy and keep uh, making the mistakes that our parents made, and you know, not becoming fluid and more acceptive of how society and people and our children are changing right before our eyes. Yep, yep, yep. Preach, preach, preach. Well, I think that's as good of a, a segue as ever to one. Uh, I think we can pretty officially say we'll be having another conversation on this, whether it's recorded or not. Um, if it's not, I feel sorry for everybody that don't know these gentlemen personally. Y'all better include me. I and I feel like I got to join that okay. damn fraternity. You just, got just me crying over your here. Damn phone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you want to after this, bro? Man, I, I I appreciate y'all y'all so much taking the time to have these conversations, man. I just imagine being a, you know, a few years back, being nervous about having getting ready. My wife was pregnant. You're nervous, even if you're ready for it. You want it. You know, you want to be a dad. You are nervous. You got questions. And so here in these conversations, I mean, it's like it's like putting in a cheat code in a video game, man. It's still an information that it takes years, years and years to learn by yourself. Uh, so thank you all for being willing to share that. I can't express enough how grateful I am um, for the dads here. Happy Father's Day, um, belated Father's Day so much. Um, and for the mentors, which it seems like all of us are. Thank you so much for all the hard work you're putting in. Um, whether people are telling you or not, uh, you can go a long time without hearing it. You're changing lives. You're building people up, um, and they're going out there and making word uh, the world a better place because of you and your guidance and your perspective. So thank you all so much for participating in, and uh, it'd be a shame for me to keep talking and mess up this vibe. So I think without further ado, Bernadine, I know you're on the other end. Uh, I think we can uh, call it good. Thank you, fellas. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. For happy Father's Day to all of you. Yeah. And I like yeah, that idea good. of a cookout. A cookout. I like that idea. Oh, yeah. Do the cookout and you do the, the, mm -hmm. you do the, uh, the Cuts Barbecue Shop and then uh, move it around, Martin. We don't have to do it in one place, but I like mm -hmm. the idea. Hey, we need to have our one night in Miami. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. So one night yeah. in Flagstaff, is that what you said? <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll be cooler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll keep y'all posted. I have, um, I think, Ricardo, you have one, but I also have a conversation with the president of the university. So one of the things I'm working on is trying to get not only just a men of color initiative going on, but like a black men's talk, black men speak, black men's um, symposium. Um, so we can continue to have this discussion. Mm -hmm. And talk, you know, talk to the brothers whether they um, be on the athletic hey, field or not. Yeah. Hey, bring Kevin James out there. Mm -hmm. Kevin James, all right. 
And I've been sharing these these conversations at work. You know, I do the DI stuff at work, and I shared a couple of conversations we had. You know, after the George Floyd verdict and um, and everything, man, and, and the last barbershops we had too, man, people appreciate hearing from y'all. Yeah. They they taking a lot of weight from just hearing where y'all coming from. So thank you so much for being willing to share. Thank you um, for the invitation. Good job. Bro. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, okay. brothers. Okay. And and you're gonna mm -hmm. you you're this is gonna be po will you let us know when it's posted? So yeah, we can all post this. Uh, Mayor Coral will send you a couple yeah. hours. She'll send you yeah. a note within the next half hour and say where it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah,